Well, Steve Zellin is in New York right now. Steve is singing, <laughs> singing CPA. Hi, Steve. Hey, Joey. How are you? Uh, and this is Jerry Del Caliano, who's probably the most famous person in radio off the air. Uh, pulls a lot of strings and has a terrific uh, bunch of followers of the, who, who admire the truth. But, you know, he doesn't get in trouble. I do. I don't know why he doesn't get in trouble. He says all oh, he these things. He gets in trouble. He finds trouble every day. That's right. I'm in trouble constantly. I'll get my yeah. wife over here. She'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Your wife is beautiful. <laughs> is that? Yes. So I attended the seminar uh, with uh, Jerry a couple of years ago. And, and you were there too, Jay. We went to the yeah. seminar. And, sure. and Jerry is a teacher also. And uh, was it USC or UCLA? Which one was it? One well, of it was USC first. Yeah. Now it's NYU. Oh, well, you know, in LA, which is a little bit more, at that time, it was very uh, accessible. And uh, people want to learn the industry. And Jerry was telling everybody in those classrooms the truth. And he was telling us what the millennials are like, mm. the younger, younger crowd, and how they don't like brands. They don't like to, uh, hype. And I remembered all the things he said, and I, I registered them in the back of my head. This is a couple of years ago now in Philly at a seminar he had, uh, the one that I uh, heard him do this in real life. Even Sean Hannity came to that particular one. As a matter of fact, so uh, uh, just to drop a name, but you know Jerry. Jerry was great because he explained this demographic, and Jay and I, Jay Sorensen and I, went to do a show on KABC and WABC, and I think Jay, I think even Steve Zellin sang on that on that show. He did. So, yeah, but we were talking a lot about about millennials and do we have to be young to, to attract young and do we have to act young and be different and you know you and i tossed back and forth jay about about all the things jerry was saying right yeah and the yeah. other day now this is the end of my little speech today but the other day i'm watching something and they were saying everything that jerry had said about millennials they said <laughs> They said, well, they don't want to hear about brand names and uh, they don't they don't want to hear hype and they just want to present it. When I brought up that girl with the AT&T commercial, right? Yeah. I brought yeah. her up and mm -hmm. someone said, well, you know, she's just plain and that's, they don't, they want it down and dirty. They just want that and that's it. So I called Jay and I said, so Caliano lives. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that, all that girl happens were, to be happens to be an actress actually who's in a, in a TV series at the moment. Oh yeah, and uh, she probably got it because she was on the AT and T commercials. So yeah. Well, it's okay. What were you going to say, Jerry? You guys might be interested. There, there are. You know, I'm teaching uh, Generation Y now. That's who's in college, and these yeah. are wonderful kids. I mean, if you don't like them, you shouldn't be teaching, right? But. They are really delightful kids who care about other people. They always ask how I'm doing, how my wife is doing, how's the family. I mean, these, I, I, I just hate to see people say derogatory things about them. They're very welcoming. They don't see gender. They don't see race. I mean, it's almost like we don't live in the United States. So, uh, but anyway, they, they, at the end of each semester, I have, uh, have them do a, um, a video in groups. And, and the first semester that I taught at uh, NYU, um, and it took a lot of guts for them to take a first, you know, time professor, take a class with somebody like that. I said, um, one group proposed to me, they pitched a topic of uh, reinventing radio. And I stopped, I said, whoa, wait, wait a minute. You're doing this because you know my background is radio and television, and I, you're going to tell me how they can reinvent it after we've talked about how this traditional media business is kind of over. We want to do it, Professor. <laughs> so I said, do it. The, the, the short um, part of the story is this. They came back with four recommendations that they said would make them interested in radio again. Would you like to know what they are? Yeah. Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> You're not going to like, well, you guys would like them, but the, the, the people who are running the radio groups, you know, they think this is, is as credible as any other criticism of their stewardship. 
But my stock is worth more than a dollar fifty. I can tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I own Apple. No, <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, here are the four things. It's really interesting. Number one, no commercials. Well, you know, if you're teaching young people, the last thing you want to do is tell them, "No, that's not possible." You, you have to have commercials. It's radio. You don't do that because you're asking them to use their head to think. I understand what they're saying. I don't want to hear any commercials either. I don't want to listen to. I don't want to listen to the crap that passes for commercials. And if you listen online, you can multiply that times ten. Oh, it's 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 oh, it's despicable. I was listening to CBS FM the other day. I love the radio station, and I think that Entercom has not screwed it up. It's not the CBS FM from your day. But it, CBS FM's been an interesting station. If you study it back to, to Joe McCoy's day, I love Joe, Joe and he, he did a wonderful job. But it's a station built around personalities. It's hard to believe that it's in intercom. And, and, I, and I, I don't want to lose my thought here about the four things, but remind me to talk about personalities and how important they are. Uh, so I'm listening online from down here in South Jersey, and... Uh, and I'm hearing three commercials for AARP on an 80s station. Now, I thought the 80s station meant music from the 80s. And, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's absolutely wrong. It's, it's for people who are in their 80s. <laughs> <laughs> it must be. It has to be. So yeah, much uh, for selling time on their, uh, their stream. Oh, Jay, it's awful. I mean, you know, it's... it's it's unlistenable. And then when they come back to the station again, you understand that they've done an artful job of it. I love those personalities. I, I love the way they do everything, including, say, C, B, S, F, M, Broadway, Bill, I love them, Scott Chan, I'll go on and on. Joe Causey, but. Not me anymore. Not you, and that's too bad, because I listened to you and I enjoyed you in that era of CBS FM. Anyway, number one, no commercials. Number two, they want local bands. All right. Now, let's say I'm talking to David Field, and I'm, he's probably one of your viewers here. So, hi, David. Uh, number two would be um, we want local bands. No commercials, local bands. Already you're not listening to these kids, right? They're done. <laughs> Even though none of them will go near a radio or anything that sounds like a radio. And if you'd like to know why, you're going to have to ask them, okay? So the third thing was they want people who sound like them. There you go. And who talk about things they care about. So when it came to people who sound like them, I asked them, I said, let me just ask you, do you mean somebody young in your age group? That was not what they meant. What they meant was somebody who sounds like them. You know, if you want to be really unsuccessful in teaching in college, go in and be a baby boomer. Go in and be a Gen Xer. Go in and sh show them how stupid their music is and how you hate, um, you know, Taylor Swift or whatever. Or you could go in and say, I love this era because it's different. Every era of music is different. Every era of radio is different. Everything is wonderful as long as you're breathing, right? So you don't, you don't go into, into a classroom and tell them that. So those were the four things. And when they said people who sound like them, it didn't mean necessarily that they had to have their voice. It meant that they had to not be condescending, not be arrogant, uh, not be, uh, um, you know, a know-it-all as not, not the, if radio people will ever sound like that. <laughs> we know that wouldn't happen. Uh, Isn't that interesting? And well, I it, is, like, it is. It is. Well, I, I think somewhere along the line here, we should tell everybody and identify uh, Jerry Del Caliano, who has a rich background in broadcasting. I mean, I, did you start as a disc jockey? I don't even remember that. Yeah, I, I actually started um, uh, here, started and ended in Philadelphia. Um, and um, I worked for, I worked at Famous 56, uh, and, and I'm not going to bore you with the stories because we all have stories, but it's just, my career is such an accident. Uh, I worked with so many good people, Jim Hilliard, Jay Cook, 
uh, Mike Joseph, when he walked in to switch the format at, uh, at, at WFIL, I didn't know who he was. I said, who is that guy? It looks like Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> Wore a suit. He did. he did. And I got to know him later in life, and he shared a lot of FIL stories with me. I mean, nobody knew what was going on. They didn't know the format was going to change. I, then I went to work for the competition. Then I went back and uh, worked for a, a, a program, my own station. Then I went back and programmed WIBG. I worked for Paul Drew. I did, worked in the Drake format. Bill Drake consulted one of the stations that I worked at. I mean, for an Italian guy, <laughs> that's not bad. Well, you were in Philly. I mean, you know, and that's it was like, Philly, which is a great, great, great place to be. Philly was a great market to be in because it's so provincial. Yeah, that's right. Um, and South and so, Philly, South Philly is a little Italian. You know that this, and they love you here. It's like in sports, you know, everybody makes fun of the fans. Yeah. You know, they boo you and everything. But that's normal. Every city boos. You, you can watch the Montreal Canadiens and they'll boo them on the power play. I mean, <laughs> we started that. We invented booing here. For a <laughs> I don't see Jay bragging about it, but uh, we, sh we should brag about it. But, well, you uh, know, you like Mike Joseph. Mike Joseph is responsible for CBS FM because they emulated ABC, which was his format. And uh, you wouldn't have that if it weren't for him. He's he, the guy that put that together. And he's such a fascinating guy. I remember yeah. having... I remember having dinner with him at the Four Seasons in Philadelphia. That's pretty nice. That's where he stayed when he came into town to do yeah. a station for Cox at 106, Electric 106, he called it. And uh, so there's nobody in the restaurant that night. We ate at 6 o'clock. I said, this is it. Now I'm going to ask him everything he never told me when I was just a kid. <laughs> and, uh, and he said to me, and I'll imitate him for you. God, God love him. He said. I said, how do you decide on the format? He says, well, you look for the hole in the market, and then you come up with the sound. I said, excuse me? He said, you come up with the sound. <laughs> when I drove home that night, I thought to myself, the sound. I've never said the word normally again, because I say it in, in, with respect to Mike. And he, I said to him, why do you go into these cities, set the station up, leave and let everybody else take credit? He says, I work a lot. And he, he made a nice living, didn't he? Yeah. Yes, but also you, you should know he likes classical music. Absolutely, yes. He was not a fan of, of pop music. Nah, that doesn't matter. You don't have to be a fan of it. But you're right, that's a good point. And he had quite a collection of albums. Yeah. I, I turned him down on a job. Uh, I was on WKVW, and I was the number one jock at the time, and he had WGR, was trying to compete with us, and I killed him. So he came over and said, okay, you win. <laughs> <laughs> he was gracious. I mean, I loved him. He was great. But he also had, was the one that put KB on the map earlier. Right. I mean, you know, we all know each other. We've all, we've all made our, our moves. It's been a fun game. It's a fun game. So what happened? When did the fun leave? Well, the fun left in 1996. I know what you mean. <laughs> Deregulation. Yeah. Can you spell that, boys and girls? When well, the tell us, what, what does that when, mean? When the me? Telecommunications Act, the Telecommunications Act of 1996 was about the telecom business. It was not about radio. The NAB, and, I, and I've had a very... Um, tough relationship with the NAB because I frankly like the people there, but I just don't like the group. All right. I don't like what they do. They're a lobby group. What they did is in the back door, they went in with this thing, which was an amendment to the telecom bill. And that amendment was to enable consolidation. This is like kissing Lowry Mays on the lips. Let's close our eyes and think about what that might be like now. That's what that was. And it was done at the last minute. So people in broadcasting, like the mom and pop operators, did not see this coming. So what happened? It passed. Consolidation was enabled. And a lot of these mom and pop and independent operators, remember, hardly anybody owned 777, 14, 14, and 14, or even 30. Um, Radio they made a fortune. because. 
private equity came in and bought them out and gave them more money than they could ever have. How can we fault them for that, right? Except they were playing into the hands of the big private equity people. So since 1996, and I said it at the time when I owned Inside Radio, uh, that uh, we've lost Steve. Okay, uh, I said it in 1996, and that is that um, that, that was the, uh, the, de- the day the radio died, if we could uh, say bye-bye American Pie. And it's not gotten any better. So what's happened in the meanwhile is every, I've, and I've been fighting this and saying it in print, and I've been called every name in the book by <laughs> certain companies. I've been sued unsuccessfully by Clear Channel. And uh, in the end, what it turned out to be is that you can't make a Main Street business a Wall Street business. They've had every asset, and all they've done is they've put more debt on it. And where do we stand today? Here we are in, in, uh, in the year 2020, and before, before COVID came along, you may remember, before COVID came along, what did iHeart do? They had one of the biggest layoffs in their history before COVID. Because these companies can't fire people fast enough. They can't do personalities in fast enough. They can't fire salespeople and replace them with computer programs fast enough. They can't monopolize fast enough. And all this was at the hands of the NAB. So maybe the NAB kind of got theirs because now they can't have their big annual convention um, and make a lot of money. Instead, they're still doing the same thing. They're out lobbying for the big boys. And I say big boys because there are no big girls. There are no big any other genders in our business. It is a male-dominated business. It's, it is a disgrace. We, we have no diversity. Uh, and, and Intercom is promoting women like crazy uh, at less money than the predecessor male who loses the job got. So they don't even get the pay that the predecessor got. They get less, and then they sit back and call it a wonderful day for women. No, it's a wonderful day for women when you get the job and you get equal pay. Yeah. This is what we should be about, and, and, and we're not. So we're in this mess. It is really serious, and if anyone cares, uh, they can uh, take a look at what, what's been written and what I've said over the years uh, ad nauseum about – the destruction of our our industry and one last thing back to personalities you know that they can't kill personalities off fast enough i've got a story running this week in inside music media about intercom's war on personalities which is coming up some of the changes that they're going to make over the next six months that are going to do some big personalities in or stretch them beyond their means because it's a company that does not in my opinion uh, understand the role of personalities. Think about this for a second. CBS FM, as of yesterday's ratings, number two in New York City, six plus. Actually, the ratings should start like it. Um, uh, it, it as soon as someone is inseminated, I think there should be a people meter inserted there so that we could get credit for every possible listener that we have for radio. Instead, we start measuring with six years and above. So at six years and above, CBS, CBS FM is number two. Take that station apart for me. Scott Shannon, Patty Steele on the morning crew. Excellent, excellent show. Without that, take it off the air. Just say, you know what? Don't come in. We don't need it anymore. We're saving money. Take some of the personalities that they have who are on the air, like Broadway Bill in the afternoon. Let's take him off. Let's just bring someone in who has worked in some other intercom market. Let's get those CBS people out of there. Because I bought CBS, but I really don't like CBS people. Okay, (laughs) You understand that, right? Well, I like CBS people. They've just been successful. They make too much money. Let's get rid of them. All right, so we'll get rid of Afternoon Drive. And some of the other people who are on the station, let's kind of get rid of them too. So we've got no morning personality. We've got nobody on in the afternoon. We are now reduced to 80s music. And as you know, 80s on the air is 80s music, and 80s online is for 80-year-old people. And um, 
And I think what you have there is you don't have a station with a six share. You don't have a station that could ever be number two. You could do the same thing with K-Earth, K-Earth 101. The best ratings it's ever had in its history with back to the Bill Drake days. And what are they playing there? 70s, 80s, and 90s, predominantly 80s. And what are they doing? Kind of a CBS FM. Oh, so why don't they have a disc jockey come in and play the records like I did? Just play the music you like. What is all this research all well, about? Anyway, good. people aren't listening to radio anyway. They're well, listening to their phone. Well, what's good so, about that? So good. why are we? Why is this such a big science all of a sudden? I mean, you know, there's uh, everybody's got one. That's the best thing about radio. Everybody's got one, and in, and they're in the cars, but not everybody uses it. They don't use it for the same reason anymore. No. Uh, I mean, you know, when I when I was on the radio years ago, we used to rely on it for school closings and uh, everything else. But weather, yeah, I mean, you don't need that anymore. Now you need to you need to have somebody who's going to tickle you a little bit, and make have some fun. Oh, you don't I need mean, traffic anymore. You got well, ways. ways. I'm not going anywhere. You think I'm going up to, and I drive up to NYU. You think I'm going to drive up the turnpike without ways to know where the, the, the state police are? There's no way, no way I'm doing it. I don't want to listen to 1010 10 winds. I love it, but I don't want to listen to it for traffic. I want ways. So you see, you're right, Joey, except that what we've done in radio is we have what's called in uh, childhood education. Uh, arrested development. <laughs> yeah, we are. We're stuck. We're stuck in. Everyone wants to be cousin Brucey. <laughs> well, he doesn't want to be cousin Brucey. Yeah, he doesn't want to be. <laughs> well, Sirius XM doesn't want. To be, but, we but, all. We all right now are are uh, sitting here and and looking at ageism too. You know, talk about Black Lives Matter. How about age? Does age matter? You know, everything matters. That's the way I look at it. I think. Let, let, let me explain Black Lives Matters from a professorial point of view. Black Lives Matters is important, and, and it doesn't mean that anything else matters. Because as soon as all lives matter, then black lives don't matter as much. And after all the years, decades, centuries of racism, I can identify with the need to be able to say that black lives matter and don't go watering it down with something else because uh -huh. that's, I just can't bring myself to go in that direction. You have got to be able to say at some point after hundreds of years of this, it is black lives matter and we've got to do something about it. But you see, there's another one, Joey, and, and the radio industry. Look, let me see if I can get everyone angry. Uh, by, uh, Back in the days of the Vietnam War and progressive rock, progressive rock, uh, radio stations where you could smell the joints that you were smoking through the speakers, that's a good, that they never repeated songs, um, that the, the radio station lifestyle seeped out of the speakers. And what did they do? They embraced revolution. They embraced change. They embraced anti-war, anti-racism. Those people all grew up and became Trump um, voters. But uh oh, now we're, now we're, we've stepped into that pool. <laughs> yeah, and that's a dirty pool to step into. But uh, but the important thing that's happened here is that in that period of time, back then, the radio station was created around the music and what a lifestyle and personalities who yep. represented the lifestyle and you wore a t-shirt for WMMS, WMMR or, or KLOS or whatever, uh, KMET back in the day, you're wearing the lifestyle of the radio station. Today, if you wear a t-shirt of a radio station, uh, you don't have any other clothes. No. <laughs> There's no reason to wear it. What's the reason? Well, I think one of the things that's going to happen now when, uh, when we, uh, when all is said and done with, with this, uh, I've been nominated for this Radio Hall of Fame, you know. And if I get in there, I'm going to start selling my autograph. <laughs> start selling T-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lucky I make two dollars. <laughs> no, you know we we used to have a lot of fun. I I think uh, part of what you're saying uh, is is uh, that the thing that the young people are missing and we are not doing anymore is relevance. Uh, 
there's a, you have to be not, not, it's not your age, it's the relevance. It's how you can relate to something and relating to change and putting it out there and having it, uh, tossing it around so that you can have some understanding of it and some fun with it, perhaps, if it's funny. But, you know, there's a, we've moved comedy to irony. We used to, what used to be funny is now ironic. So we're not looking at comedy to laugh. We're looking at something for, a, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean, it's a different factor. That's just part of my little philosophy. I, I think that uh, uh, we need a training camp for, for young people, for personalities. I think we, we missed the boat on that one like you do with basketball. I watched the heat today, incidentally. I, I don't mean the temperature of the room. I'm talking about them playing without an audience. But you know what they did today very cleverly? I was watching the reruns. They, they beat uh, – well, they're, they're playing the Nuggets. But you know what they do? They have a, they have a fake uh, soundtrack. But it doesn't sound it. And they're doing it at Disney. So what Disney's done is they've created a, an, an ambiance because only they could do it. They're motion picture geniuses. It looks like there's a full, state, a full uh, auditorium. And, and they have the same sound and action and, and, and the, the routine. They made it work. So, you know, that's the point, is we can make it work. You know, radio needs to do, you need a Mike Joseph who does fill a hole. The hole right now, they, all, they could all jump into it as far as I'm concerned because they haven't come to the place where they understand that the end result is a listener. And it's a relationship that you have with somebody. It's somebody that wants to be with you. That, that understands something that you are talking about, and they may even disagree with you, like families. But they'll go along with it to a certain extent. And then, you know, if you get too crazy, you lose them. But, but I think somewhere along the line, we have, to ha we have to allow people to have that field of dreams where they can learn how to do this and have the freedom to do it instead of everybody who's learning broadcasting become a newsman and a field reporter because that's what we've done. We put them all out. The news has the money. So the news people hire young people and they put them out on the field and have new stories. Nothing wrong with that, but we need to have personalities. And, you know, I mean, you mentioned Scott Shannon and Tom and all these guys they are wonderful, but we, you need a new crop uh, as well. Both are fine. So, you know, what, what about the new crop? What about people who are coming up now who really love uh, the idea of communication, who love to, who love to be relevant and want to, and they have imagination and they want to create something. Where is that? That's you're, what's missing. You're not going to see that happen in radio because radio is really, and I take no pleasure in saying this because we radio folks, if, if you spent your career working in radio, it meant that you did not want to make the money that you had a right to make in Chick-fil-A, for example. <laughs> Because we've all worked for that kind of money. And occasionally when you had a couple of good years, it's great. And then the manager calls you in, but the manager's drunk and fires you when, you're, when he's drunk and you wind up out of a job again. And I mean, you've got to love this business to be through what you guys have been through and me. But uh, it's over. And uh, uh, Say I'm, that again. I'm, it's over. It's over because... The next, we lost millennials because of um, consolidation, lost a generation that we always thought would be there. And we have totally lost Gen Z, which is a really great generation coming behind them. Yeah. Both of them are, are highly populated. They're going to create the politics of the world. That's why you don't have to worry if you're a, a progressive like me or, or as they, as my enemies say when they write me a nasty email you east coast liberals i don't know i'm proud of that i like I, I like i like being an east coast liberal um but what's what the problem is is there's no need for radio among these people yeah take for a minute baby boomers they grew up listening to its hits it's heaven it's 77 whatever garbage you wanted to put on a jingle that was 10 miles long you could put it on i'll listen to it and you know what? I'll listen to a lot of commercials and you can hit a gong after every record and tell me what the chime time is. And I'll still stick around because we loved hype. That was it. We we're the hype generation. And Joey, you mentioned earlier, and we should address it, is that we're in the opposite world today. So if I get on and say to you, you know, I've got to tell you that I just uh, got three uh, Oscar nominations. Uh, 
a guy named Oscar walked in and he said, uh, I'm nominating you three times. You know? uh, <laughs> let's say, let's say that's, let's say that happened. Uh, they don't want to hear that. Uh, you, my students don't want to hear anything about me. They already know about me. They've checked me out. How do they check me out? Call the FBI. Yes. You know, they, they, they look, they go online. They know how to use this. Yeah. So, so now it's not about the things that baby boomers liked which was hype. They liked it, still like it to this day. Remember the next generation that followed them, Gen X. Always remember this. It was the generation that came up with this wonderful term, radio sucks. That wasn't That's a baby <laughs> boomer. Baby boomer would never say those words, but Gen X came up with that and they had MTV and they had AIDS and they had all the things that made them the unique generation. When millennials came along, listen to uh, Taylor Swift, as I do, because Taylor Swift is really the voice track of that generation in so many ways. The next generation that's coming up is, is, is even more different. And what does new millennials and, and Gen Y have in common? They have no use for radio at all. I don't care what you say that you would offer them. They don't need 30 songs over and over again when they can have as many as they want and discover them. We in radio could say, you know, <clears throat> I'm a program director. I'll tell you, you play the hits over and that's what I did. Play the hits, cut the playlist, and we get good ratings. That's not how you get listeners in this world today. They want variety. They want diversity. And they care about what other people listen to. I never cared as a program director what anybody wanted to add. I would listen to 60 songs. Record people would come in the office. They would say, here, you got to play this Maddie Singer, Maddie Umdinger Singer. Come in. Gary, Gary, you got to play this record. I can't play it, Maddie. Jay's playing it. I, I don't care if Jay's playing it. I'm not leaving until you play this record. I said, oh, now you're getting serious. I'm not, I'm not leaving. All right, so you play the record. You're adding one, taking two off. This is not the world that we live in today. We're not playing enough music. So there's no circumstance under which a radio station, there's no talk station for young people. It's just for old people on a AM. And okay. it's conservative talk. And, and none of these people are conservative. The, the, the generations that are your growth generation. Yeah. It's, there's no way. So the one question that I get from time to time is, if you owned a radio station, what would you do with it? And I always say, I'd sell it. But now I wouldn't say that because you can't sell it. But I think you give it to a you give it to a someone from Gen Z or or a millennial, and you say to them, "Listen, um, you do something with it. Come back and tell me what you would want to do, and we'll do it." But I tell the story that I think uh, a Big J will appreciate, and that is mm. it. You know Camden, New Jersey. Camden, New Jersey has been a, just a, a mess yeah. for as long as we've been on this planet. Yeah. But if you went in there, Jay, and you took some of your money from CBS FM and built a $10 million mansion, <laughs> if you did, just say, just say you did. If you did a $10 million mansion, do you know what you would have? You would have a $10 million mansion in a blighted area. And that's yeah. what the problem is with radio. Radio has so many owners that are just playing songs with no personalities, stations that have no service to the community, no reason to exist, that are not connected to any listeners. And if you came along and did the greatest radio in the world, you would be building a $10 million mansion in Camden, New Jersey. And Jay, save your money. That's <laughs> not Yeah. Okay. So then why not program to the people who still do listen to radio. Well, we lost them already. Yes. And it's, A, the advertisers don't want them. Yeah. B, you lost them already. You, you don't grow. Look. What if, we're doing right here is where, is where this generation excels, but not necessarily our talk, because that's probably boring. But, they, but this is what they're doing. They're, they're searching for, for this kind of involvement not the kind that we presented before, which was hype. I agree with you, Jerry. I, 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 it was flash. It was glam. Well, I can speak for myself uh, about boring. Yes, I know what I am. But, uh, but you guys are going to have to speak for yourself. <laughs> the thing is that 
that um, there's no reason for it to exist. And if someone came along and did a good job, it's too late. Now, yeah. would it ever come back? Yes. I give you a circumstance. Someday, privacy is really going to be a big issue because Big Brother's all over our phone, all over my Apple Watch. They're all over. You know, Apple's coming out with glass. You'll be wearing glass necks and you'll have everything right on your face. Imagine teaching a class like that when they're able to see their their apps and they're looking at you and they're smiling and you're thinking, my God, they're yeah. smiling. Playing they're video looking. games. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but someday they're going to be concerned about privacy. And one thing about radio is it's uh, one to many medium in a one to one world. So you see the reason why people get mad at me and I'm sorry. I apologize. I love no, this radio. But it's true. I love radio people. But we, we live in a one-to-one -one world. If, if Microsoft came along and decided they wanted to invent the iPod, remember the iPod? If they wanted to invent the iPod, they would have to come up with something they call the Zoom, which, oh, by the way, is exactly what they did. And it's out and, of and, and they're buying TikTok, too. <laughs> now, well, well, Microsoft's going to buy TikTok, but... But or they want to anyway. But let well, me. And then the, the government is relieved to the fact that we 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 can get rid of China that way. Yeah, we're well, mad at them this week. Started on the government. <laughs> Just don't don't go there. But there's all these things are involved. They're all see. You yeah, know what you talked about the the uh, seed of it all, the germ of it all was was with what you were talking about. What ruined radio at the beginning in the in the mid '90s was actually during the time when we wanted to get rid of the equal time law. Fair, fairness and, doctrine. And the fairness doctrine was uh, people who have no voice because they had no money who had less of a voice. And the people who had all the money could organize and run for office. And that was the game. So now yeah. you have Congress and Senate and presidencies that way. And, and the radio would have, would, have, would have really cleansed a lot of it if we had the balls. But, you know, it was, the ball was taken away from us. And now let me ask you a question. Does this FCC commissioner, have, does he have own a radio, the guy that we got now? It, it, it really doesn't matter because... Because um, no one else listens anyway. <laughs> it would be like, it'd be like <laughs> appointing, appointing one of your big donors postmaster general. I mean, what's the difference what it is? is it, like, you know, they say, well, listen, Mr. President, I gave you millions of dollars. I'd like to have a job. Okay, good. Hold on. Jared, what do we have available? Postmaster <laughs> General, would you like Postmaster General? Yes, I would. You got it. That would be like putting me in charge of, of, of the post office would be a mistake because I'd be kissing everybody. That's all I think post office is. <laughs> so, no, it, it's just that, you know, here, here's another way to look at it. I, it and, and I must say that my career in academia has been probably one of the most rewarding times of my life because I look at everything differently now. I look at things in terms of generation. Let me take you quickly. The greatest generation that we've seen in a long time was World War II generation. They made the sacrifices, saved the country, came back and they had baby boomers who did everything that they could to be spoiled and love their radio and love their Woodstock. And we did have some of the best music, I think. <laughs> I mean, come on, let's, let's give ourselves some credit for something. But then our first kids came along and they were, uh, they were um, lost. Gen X. And Gen X came along at the time of AIDS. That's a big deal with kids. And they were kind of, it's not a large generation, a very small generation, so they didn't have a lot of clout. After that came millennials, the largest generation ever born, and more entitled and empowered because they had devices that their parents didn't have. They knew how to do things that nobody else knew how to do, and they took the world over. And now we have, and there's a theory that every fourth generation is a great generation. We now have the fourth generation since then, which is um, Gen Y, I'm sorry, Gen Z, which, uh, which I believe is going to be a great generation. What age? What age is that? Well, let's see, they're in college now, so some of them are 19 or 20, and they're still, still manufacturing them back. In My the grandchildren's ages. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
but they're, they're, they are. And, and I'm not just saying, I love my students no matter what, because they're, they give you back so much more than you can give them. But here's what one of my students said when, when we had someone from uh, TikTok come into the classroom. Um, TikTok is big. It is big. That's how people discover music. But one student said, and remember, this is a music school. This is not radio. This is the music business. She said, well, it, it's big now, but there'll be something else in five years. There will. That is a wise student right there. Yeah. There's an A student right there, because what are we talking about? We're talking about radio that's been dead for <laughs> 1996. And we're trying to say, well, can't we get a surgeon in here to operate on it? I mean, can't we bring back some of these people? Could we find a way to survive? No, that's not how you do it. You go in there and you attack um, a need. You create something that is not just good, but compelling. And if you go back and look at any of the radio you like, you'll find out that you were addicted to it because you were compelled to listen to it. But we're in a world, and we got don't be too rough on radio, we're in a one-to-many medium that works very well like that, but we live in a one-to-one -one world where we communicate by device. It's not gonna happen. Now, if they don't wanna hear that, I could start a trade publication uh, with a couple of banner ads, and I could kiss everyone's ass. But uh, don't print. Don't print it. Yeah. You better or, do it a lot. Or, or I could not take the ads and uh, and and get people to to subscribe and tell them what I really think, which is what I just told you, which yeah. is that I f I feel for all of us who love this business. But let's not kid ourselves. It is not coming back. And these people who are running it now. Yeah, you watch the next week. Beasley came out today. I wrote a story about this about two weeks ago. Beasley came out today and said, "Well, they're they're only off fifty percent." You try that, okay, <laughs> Joey? You run the radio station. Come back and say, "Listen, I'll tell you what. I beat it. I'm 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 back. I'm only down forty five percent. Really? You're fired." Well, why did why did iHeart uh, have bankruptcy and then continue to own sixteen hundred stations? And well, how did Cumulus have two thousand stations and they're bankrupt? How come nobody gave them uh, what we all get when we can't pay our bills? Well, bankruptcy is a way of protecting people, but at the expense of others. In other words, people are screwed. Yeah. You, you do get screwed in bankruptcy. In, in, in Cumulus, they wound up with a $1.1 billion worth of debt when they came out of bankruptcy, and that was too much. Mm -hmm. Joe, Field, uh, Joe Field, David Field has two billion, almost $2 billion worth of debt on Intercom right now, without the money coming in to even service that debt. iHeart has a little under $6 billion worth of debt. And, uh, and when Liberty comes in and takes over, which I believe is going to happen, you watch John Malone, because he's a shrewd dude. He'll be in there, he'll, he'll get him out of debt. Um, he'll sell uh, what he has to sell. Well, he'll sell what he has to sell, or he'll pay down debt. And then he will take all that rich cash flow that still comes out of radio, instead of paying it to debt, he'll take that and put it to his shareholders. That's the only way you can operate today. Said. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Unfortunately, I don't like it, but it's true. No, and I'm not on that page anyway. I'm on the way out of that game, but I'm, I'm in the other game, which is what you're talking about. And I love you for that. So uh, I pay attention to you because I like where you're at and I like where you're going and I like what you say because I agree with it. So you can, love, you can love the radio business and obviously that nothing gets me angrier when somebody says, well, you don't love the business. No, I love this business. Yeah. I left television to come in here. Or as I used to tell my students, I said, you know, in radio, you really don't have to be that good looking. Would you agree with me on that? And they go, yeah. <laughs> I'd say, of course, I started in television, and then they go, oh, oh, all right. Well, <laughs> I did a telethon once. <laughs> <laughs> we love, people in this business are crazy. We, well, we, we have a million and one stories. Even when we compete with people, we become friends with them afterwards. It's like hockey. We take your tooth out, and then we shake hands with you at the end. I love hockey. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, I'm going to say it for the third time because it's that important. We live in a one-to-one -one world, our phone to our phone, text yeah. to text. We want information. It's there right away. We don't need 10-10 wins with all due respect. You know what we need? 
we, and if we broadcast one to many, we are doing what is not um, natural in our world of communication today. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm doing a story, if I ever have the nerve to write it, I, I actually write it, if I have the nerve to run it, it's about Apple Glass. Radio people hate when I write about this stuff because they only want to read about radio. But this is, this is really something. They're going to come out with this in about a year or two. And, and I had somebody come into my class and actually tell us about a year ago this was coming. Uh, so you wear these real clear things. They're, they're not ugly looking. You know Apple, they're going to make them look good. And what's on them, and this is in the story that I wrote, I have a link to this so you can see what it looks like. Someone did a, um, you know, a dramatization. You, you, all your um, apps will come up in front of your face. You'll be able to listen to your music. You'll be able to, and this is really important to Gen Z, you'll be able to have augmented reality. And if I could have brought you into my class to see what that meant, it means this. So let's say the students are looking at Professor Del Caliano and uh, they have their glasses on. And after about five seconds, they're bored. So they want to put me in hell. So they just go to augmented reality of hell burning. And, <laughs> and I'm sitting and standing in front of the class with Beelzebub behind me with a thing. And, you know, because that's what augmented reality is. And this is important to their generation. This is how they stay interested and stay tuned. And if we want to criticize it, then I think we need to go to a reunion. That's what I tell my friends in radio. If you're not going to like the way the world is today, go to some WFIL reunion, have a great time, get it out of your system, and then come back to the real world again because the real world is really, really different. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, my whole life is built on, it used to be on payola, which was a gift. Now it's built on GIF. Just GIF. G-I-F. <laughs> I, <have, laughs> I have this reality around me. Right. GIF. <laughs> hey, listen. If the uh, promo uh, guy came in and the promo guy said, listen, I'm, I'm going to give you a GIF. You'll say, oh, really? What is yeah. it going to be? Drugs? <laughs> <laughs> I think we lost a listener during this and a viewer. We lost Steve uh, Zelnick, yeah. uh, uh, who uh, Steve Zellen, who's the singing CPA. Uh, did I was I disrespectful, Jay? I mean, you can be a judge of that. Yeah. I think I changed the subject on him, right? Yeah, I, I think we should do the intro to the show over again. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I want to show you. I want to show you the future. You want to see it? Well, yeah. Can I give you a real? I mean, let's just have a reality check, okay? This is the future. Lily, say hello. You there? <laughs> oh, hi, cutie. <laughs> Killian, hi. Yeah. Okay, we were talking about young people making a difference, right? She's cute. Yeah, mm -hmm. there you go. She's too cute. Yep, so there we go with these guys. Now, there, that's the future that you're and talking you know about and after you know this what, one. You know what, Joe? What? Let's remember this because you you brought it up, and that is that these folks in the next generation deserve to be treated with respect yeah. and help because we don't need to lecture people as to what they like or don't like. We don't have to lecture them as to how to be or how not to be. We want to set a great example. We want to do this in college, in great universities like NYU, which I love. Uh, and we want to do it in our personal lives, too, because it matters how we set <clears throat> our um, um, future with them. They look at you and realize that you're open to ideas. You're accepting to things that they care about. I mean, if we did more of this in the world, and by the way, isn't that what a communicator is? Yeah. So our industry may be troubled, but we've still got a mission, and that mission is to go out there and do the thing that everyone has earned the right to do, which is to communicate. Yeah. Well, I've learned uh, the difference between subscription and commercial radio and television. <laughs> and I, I know that uh, there's a great move on NBC's part now with the Peacock, which we used to always think the Peacock was raped 
when we were there. But uh, that Peacock network they've started, they, they now have three levels. Did you know that? You pay, you, you get free with commercials. And then the second level is a premium. And the other one is a premium premium. I mean, you know, we're on levels of paying for something. We've, well, now we're conditioned to pay for things. That's that's what's and, that's, and that's quite astute of you because I, I really believe that. You know, 10 years ago, I started Inside Music Media and uh, I had 12,000 people reading me for free. And I used to talk for a year. I said, I'm going to make this. I'm putting so much time into it. I'm going to make it a subscription. People will write to me and say, Jerry, I like you for free, but for, for $9.99, I'm not going to read you. And so the first day we went to paid subscriptions, um, I had, uh, at the end of the day, I had 31 subscribers. My wife said to me, out of 12,000 people, you have 31 subscribers. What are you going to do now? I said, I'm going to write the story for them tomorrow. And then I'll have 32. <laughs> and I'll have 32. <laughs> you see, you're right. Because look at the, look, Joey, we live in a world where we're willing to pay for music that we could get for free. We're willing to pay for video, not willing, anxious to pay for some kind of service, usually more than one. We will pay for subscriptions for anything. In fact, keeping track of the subscriptions that we've paid for is, is, is a, difficult. So we're now saying that we'll pay for that which we want and that model will change. The one thing that isn't going to work is podcasting because podcasting is every bloviator in the world oh, it's needs to do radio. Yeah. Cut me a break. Hmm. And I, and I want to say podcast, something. Make it a minute. And, and you brought this up too. You know, lawyers are now working for nothing. They get on television and they're going to, if they, they, they won't take any money if they don't win the case. <laughs> yeah, that, there's a believable one, right? There we go. <laughs> well, uh, and, let me read all that print at the bottom of the screen in one half of a second. <laughs> uh, well, I love you, Jerry. You're great. Thanks, and thank you, for, about you. thank you for staying uh, with all of, with all of our, our uh, contemporaries and, and, and helping us to uh, advance. Yeah. Thank well, you. I've, I've, I've gotten more out of it than you. I've enjoyed it. Frank, nice to meet you. My uh, yeah, he's, poor guy, he's, you got to do to this next. And Big J, it's always a pleasure. Remember, Jersey Pride. Jersey you got to watch. You got to watch the tape with uh, that we did. It's not a tape. The digital performance with uh, Charlie Warner, who also is doing what you're doing with, with the New School, and he's teaching online. Uh, and he's he's also got his his work cut out for him. He's another kind of guy that that I disagree mm -hmm. with, but I love it. <laughs> yeah. And you know, that's the beautiful part. We're actually in a world that's so, uh, so politically correct that we can't tell a joke anymore. We can't disagree without liking somebody. I like Sean Hannity a lot and you can tell, and, I, and you can't get any more liberal than I am. I mean, I'm waiting for the day AOC is president. Well, I'm proud okay. of being a liberal, but that's you know okay. what? You know what? But if you don't agree with me, it's amazing how I love you. And the, and the reason for that is because uh, I grew up in a world where, where people still disagreed whether they were from one side or the other. They didn't get rid of their friends because they had different beliefs. They just maybe made fun of them, made jokes or argued with them or whatever. But this and this. the world now has gotten so nasty that we, we, we can't even hear uh, a different point of view without um without taking it personally and i just don't want to do it i don't mind if if people don't like my point of view but i respect their point of view and if they think that uh they don't like liberals that's fine but that's the way i look at the world and i didn't have to go to college to be a liberal and so but on the other hand sean hannity is a good man in a lot of ways and i know that's hard for people to put their arms around but he's been a friend of mine. He's a guy who has, when I've called him and told him there's been need to help children, he has written checks and he won't talk about it publicly. And I won't say any more than to say that I don't mind telling you that as much as I disagree with him and I do on his politics, uh, on a personal level, I'm not going to disagree with him as a human being, because I think as a human being, he's done many, many good things. Those are the ducks walking by. <laughs> so there's more than one quack on the screen. Is that what you're I know. Saying? And right. let me tell you the best thing to come out of South Philly. 
the northbound train. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jerry. Jerry Del Caliano. Now, let's, we should uh, tell everybody what your site is. Well, I do a thing called Day, Day Starters, which are motivational pieces every day. It's free. Daystarters.com. And Inside Music Media is for people in the industry. And you can read a teaser every day and see if you can get into the story. If you do, you can subscribe. If not, you can just read the teaser. Well, I love you and I want to thank, thank you. you. And you take care of yourself. And say bye to Big J. Yeah, let a smile be an umbrella. Don't get a mouthful of rain. <laughs>